Hi everyone, happy Friday and welcome to Plum Market's first ever cocktail making and tasting event. As many of you already know, Plum Market is a Detroit based grocery and specialty realtor retailer with a focus on all natural, organic, and locally crafted items to meet the needs of the health conscious, our fellow foodies, and anyone that's looking for high quality ingredients and products for their health and home. With that insight into what Plum Market is all about, it's kind of a no-brainer that we decided to partner with such an esteemed local company to create this exciting new product. I think I speak for everyone at Plum Market when I say that we are beyond thrilled to introduce and share with you our signature crafted collaboration with Detroit City Distillery, Market Gin. Now, I know all of you are excited to make some cocktails and drink some gin, but I want to cover just a couple of things before we start. First, I want to make sure that everyone has the best viewing experience possible. Um, so I'm going to ask all of you to turn your attention to the bottom of your screen where you should see a little video camera icon and a little carrot next to that. You're gonna click on that little carrot. You're gonna click on video settings. And then you're gonna scroll down to where you can see the little checkbox next to hide non-video participants. You wanna make sure that is checked um, and then you can close out the screen and you're all set, we're good to go. Um, next, um, as we go along, you may think of some questions that you want to ask, and that is great. We encourage you to enter your questions into the question box that is also um, in the menu at the bottom of your screen. And then we'll go through all those questions at the end of the tasting with Garrett and Travis. Lastly, I want to mention the Instagram contest that we are running. So in your Market Gin kit, you should have received a handout on this Instagram contest, but I'm going to show you all of the details here on the screen. Okay, so you are eligible to win a $100 Plum Market gift card for the best market cocktail photo. So we want you to take a picture of each of the cocktails and post it on Instagram using the hashtag Market Gin, and then make sure you tag Plum Market and the posts for a chance to win. Um, you can enter three times, so one for each cocktail. And then the only thing that you need to do is make sure that your profile is public so that we are able to see it. Um, and then we will choose a winner. All right, next. Um, well, actually, <laughs> that's all the housekeeping notes that I have for now. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Plum Market's expert mixologist and the creator of the three signature cocktails we will be enjoying tonight, Travis Reeves. Thank you, Lindley. Welcome, everybody. I'm excited to be here. I hope you are as well. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background before I hand it off to Garrett here. Uh, so the idea for this uh, kind of came about with a, a few different um, avenues. So Plum Market has a lot of single barrel, uh, the single barrel whiskeys that they do in their bourbon program and such. And uh, they have such good success with that. I thought it really would make a lot of sense for us to have um, a, a gin or a vodka or some other signature item that we could get behind. Um, and I saw so much success going on with uh, Detroit City Distillery with some of their collaborations like Lady of the House Gin. And uh, it just made a lot of sense. So uh, when I got to go ahead, I approached them and they were really excited about it as well. Um, after meeting with them, they first uh, they discussed a little bit of the style, what we might be looking to do, and uh, they took me into the back room, which had a wall of all their botanicals, which is really impressive. Um, I'd say maybe about 100 different ones, and uh, took some pictures of that, got some ideas. I didn't want to get uh, too far ahead of myself yet, but um, after, after uh, leaving there and having all those botanicals in mind, uh, I decided that a style... Um, that I most wanted to do is something that would be really approachable to people, but unique still. Um, it's something that would pair well with the tonic, the martini, but exotic enough that you could do with some different cocktails with it, do something fun at home. Uh, but as a bartender by trade, uh, I'm always looking for something that's a good transition, a good bridge for people getting into from uh, vodka into uh, gin and, and things of that nature. There's so many gin cocktails out there uh, that I think uh, not everything is a London dry style that's juniper forward. So something like this can, be a little bit more versatile. Uh, and then uh, marketing came up with an amazing uh, label for us. 
um, I think we're, we're really excited about that. Um, so the Thai lime leaf is one of the highlights of this gin, uh, citrus forward as well. Uh, the Thai lime leaf just has this um, amazing aroma to it, really floral, it's really unique. Um, and uh, I've used it a, a lot in cocktails in the past. It's very well known in, in Thai cuisine in particular, but Southeast Asian, you'll find it in, in sauces and soups of that nature. Um, in addition to those botanicals, of course, there's juniper in there. It is the, the largest portion of any of the botanicals. Uh, lemon, lime, coriander, there's thyme, uh, and lemon balm leaf, which is kind of similar to mint. Uh, the, it's 100% corn. I'm sure Gareth's going to tell you a little bit about that, and it's small batch as well. Uh, he's going to take you through the, the distillery and kind of show you the, the still in the process there. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Garrett in the distillery. Hey folks, Travis, can you hear me? All right, welcome everybody. My name is Garrett. Travis, uh, how, how are we doing on sound? Everyone can hear me? We are in a 25,000 square foot, um, former abandoned ice cream factory from Stroh's. So I just wanna make sure everyone can hear me all right. We can hear you. Um, the sound is great. I think Travis might be having a little bit of trouble with his sound. So we are good to go. All right, no worries. First of all, I'd like to welcome everybody. Thank you so much for having a nice Friday happy hour. It's going to be a great time. Um, what I'm gonna do before we go up and make some cocktails, Travis is actually gonna teach me how to make these amazing craft cocktails with the Plum Market Gin, okay? But prior to that, um, I am, we are all flattered here at Detroit City Distillery that Travis went ahead, Plum Market, to choose us as a spot to make such a high quality gin. Um, I'm gonna go through the history of Detroit City uh, Distillery and a little bit of that distillation pro process. And when we go upstairs, that's where we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna start making some cocktails with the gin. But what's the deal with Plum Market Gin? What's the deal with, um, you know, Detroit City Distillery. Let's take a really, really quick trip back in history in time, all right? So Detroit City Distillery in Eastern Market, founded by eight friends that have known each other since the age of three, five years old. So we're talking preschool, kindergarten, all right? Long story short, what they were doing, if anyone's ever heard of a town called Bath, Michigan, right outside of Lansing, okay? If you haven't heard of that, they make the joke because they're from there. You're not supposed to have heard of it just because there's absolutely nothing there. It's farm country, all right? What they were doing is they had a liquor store that they had a friend that was working at that used to sell to them underage in high school. That friend got caught and they had nothing else to do except for go ahead on the dial-up connection, AOL, boom, if anyone remembers that, and downloaded a PDF on how to make your own in-house moonshine. They've been doing it in Bourbon County, Kentucky, they found out. So that's what they did, got the recipe, and they started mixing it way back in um, the farm country of Bath, Michigan. They called it prune juice, all right? So it consisted of grapes, yeast, and water, all right? Not the best tasting alcohol you have, but when you're in high school, you take a sip, take a little bit of a chaser, and it got the job done, all right? Got so popular with the high school students that they all ended up bottling it putting it in their, quote, stash houses, which was under their beds at their parents' house. One of our co-owners, Michael Forsyth, um, his mother was at home. She was vacuuming. He was in high school. All of a sudden, she heard this gigantic combustion explosion, ran, ran up to his uh, bedroom and found shattered glass and moonshine all over his room, like any patient mother would do. Went ahead, waited, and everyone was grounded for the rest of the summer. So the eight friends that founded Detroit City Distillery were the eight bootleggers of Bath, Michigan High School, all right? Fast forward, everyone grows up, technically, wink, all right? What ends up happening, of all the eight friends that actually get degrees and go to college, our master distiller and co-owner to this day is John Paul Jerome, we call him JP, call him dad. He ends up getting a uh, PhD in microbiology from Michigan State University. Now go blue or go green. You have to give credit to Michigan State University when it comes to the, A, their agricultural program, 
and their PhD when it comes to distillation, the making of spirits, the um, vineology, the making of wine, and brewing, the making of beer. All right. What they originally wanted to do was create a brewing company. So we're going back about eight to 10 years because we are about to turn six years old this year, September. All right. September 7th to be exact. It'll be our six year birthday. Um, they wanted to make a brewing company. And he said, hold on a second. Let me go work for a brewing company first. Let me get the standard operations and procedures down. The recipe's right. A lot of times breweries pop up. Marketing's great, but the product is not good. Okay. So raise your hand if you've ever had a Bell's Two Hearted or a Bell's Oberon. All right. He went out, went ahead and uh, started working at Bell's Brewing Company. They went on a bachelor party. Um, one of the eight friends got engaged after a couple of beers, after a couple shots of whiskey. They said, you know something? Let's go ahead and make a dis uh, distillation company. Let's create a distillery. A, let's do it in Eastern Market. Let's make it from good quality Michigan grains only. Okay, so all of our grains and all of our spirits, including the Plum Market Gin, all from uh, primarily out of Dexter Mills Farms right outside of Ann Arbor. These barrels that you see behind me, everything aged in new charred American oak barrels out of Crow's Nest Coopery right outside of Grand Rapids. And as we're about to see right now, everything distilled here right in Eastern Market at 1000 Maple Street in the old Stroh's Ice Cream Factory. So. What we did originally is we started over there in Eastern Market on Riopel Street, Riopel, Riopel, tomato, tomato. But what we did is worked off a 50 gallon copper pot still. Again, another long story short, the butcher's cut bourbon right here was amazing in the fact that it was aged under two years. And a lot of people started sipping it and they said, that's an amazing bourbon for age under two years. What they did is they submitted it to a contest called the American Distillation Institute. It's a blind taste testing contest in Bourbon County, Kentucky. Um, it's the Olympics of bourbon, no politics. Judges have no idea what they're drinking. This ends up winning two gold medals, voted best bourbon in the United States in the category of age under two years. All right, after that happens, demand happened. All right, and they started to panic because we're working off a 50 gallon copper pot still. Um, what we're about to learn is spirits, especially with aged spirits, can't be made overnight, all right? Came over here to the Stroh's factory. Stroh's ice cream factory started making ice cream during Prohibition in the fact that when they read the Volstead Act, there was a small little asterisk during Prohibition. Two point, or, uh, you could produce any type of syrups, elixirs, or tonic, 3.8% ABV or lower for the purposes of cooking and medicine. That's why Stroh's brewing company started making ice cream because you could come here it was almost like a pilgrimage all, all across the United States, coming to Detroit, Canada's right across the river. You can go ahead and grab your booze, take a dinghy over. But what they would do is they would take our syrups, elixirs, and tonics, go ahead and make um, your own in-house bathtub gin, boom, hence the actual birth. So with Grandpa Yogi of the Butcher Cut Bourbon, John Paul's grandfather, used to be a bootlegger and the uh, butcher in Eastern Market. So that's why we're here today making good, hard-holded Michigan um, local, just like Plum Market does, everything local, everything fresh. That's what we do here at Detroit City Distillery. So we are 100% completely honored for Travis and everyone at uh, Plum Market to go ahead and choose us to make an amazing gin, which we're about to find out and go upstairs and make a couple cocktails. Prior to that though, let's go through the distillation process really quickly. Everyone ready? Let's do it. All right. So those you walking through here, again, these are all whiskey barrels, aged again, four shard American oak barrels from Grand Rapids, Crow's Nest Coopery. Okay, before we go upstairs, and um, a lot of you might have that gin in your hands, even if you have some whiskey in your hands, let's go through the distillation process in general, okay? So you have beer, you have wine, and you have spirits. How does that work? 
how do you make liquor, quote, spirits, etc. All right. When you're making wine, throw some grapes into a barrel, let it ferment, go ahead and bottle it, filtrate it through, boom, done. When you're making beer, what you're doing is you're making almost like an oatmeal flavor. So you're throwing in, for you IPA fans, a lot of hops, a lot of uh, any type of flavor. You're boiling that up and then you're filtrating it through. When you're making a spirit, it's a little bit more technical when science comes into play because it's a three-stage process, all right? So what I'm gonna do is really quickly walk you through the process of how you make a spirit. In this case, because we're celebrating Plum Market Gin, how do you make a gin, all right? How do you make any type of spirit? You can go ahead and follow me. There's a three-stage process. It's called a mix, a wash, and then the still, all right? Now, for those of you that walk, like waking up kind of um, to gin, all right? When we go back to when you used to drink gin, like Tangare or like your grandfather's like Gordon's when you're in high school or college, and you're making like gin and tonics, you get a little bit of a headache, all right? I always tell gin fans that are, um, that are just getting into gin, don't be afraid of gin, okay? There's a nice science, a lot of chefs, a lot of mixologists like Travis. You really get into gin because you can customize it, all right? So I always like to compare gin to tea, okay? So you have green tea, you have chamomile tea, you have gray tea, et cetera, and keep going down the line. Blueberry tea, raspberry tea. When you're making gin, Okay, what you're doing is you're having a great mixologist or a great chef going ahead and choosing different types of botanicals like Travis was talking about when he went in and there's hundreds of botanicals. What you wanna do is that perfect flavor profile to make the perfect flavorful cocktail that you're doing. So in this case with the Plum Market Gin, heavy citrus, etc. cetera. You're gonna have juniper because gin has a lot of juniper in it. What you're doing in the gin making process is you're fractionally distilling, all right? So you're using a neutral grain spirit. In our case, we use our neutral grain spirit with our vodka, which is pretty much almost 100% blue corn from Michigan, okay? Lots of gin makers will use a type of like whiskey or a type of like white, like dog lightning as they call it. What we do is we use our vodka and then what Travis and the Plum Market team did is they chose their botanicals, steeped it, went ahead and put it into the still, combined it, fractionally distilled it, and they vap um, evaporate, uh, used the evaporation to cool it down and make the good quality gin that all of you are about to enjoy. How did they do that? What you do is you put it into a mixer, take all those junipers, take all those citruses that Travis had, and then what you do, Take it into a washer, go ahead, add some yeast, get that alcoholic fermentation. And that what you're doing, where all the magic happens, you're putting it into a still. Now when you're doing in the still, so if you can imagine almost like a tea bag that you're putting into a hot copper pot, all right? That's giving it that flavor. You're putting it up into about 190 degrees by evaporation through a, uh, through a condenser, you're cooling it down and you're turning it into that liquid gin. It's gonna come off at about 200 proof, 100% alcohol, just like the moonshiners used to do. And then this right here is a hydrometer. That's where they have the water levels that proofs it up, sorry, proofs it down to about 88 proof, 44% alcohol right there. That goes into the bottle that has all the botanicals. And what you're doing with that vapor, once they open that copper pot still, again, I talked about beer, I talked about wine, I talked about uh, spirits. The first distillers, when they open it up, this is a fun history fact, a vapor comes out and it looks like a ghost or a spirit. That's why when you're drinking liquor, a lot of people you know, say like, why is it called the spirit? Again, it looks like a ghost or a spirit. If it's clear, it comes right off the still. If it's aged, it goes right into those barrels. And it's what they call whiskey taking a nap. So it sits there for about two years, anywhere from three years. If you're talking about when you see the Macallan scotches that are 18 years, they've been sitting there for 18 years, so. 
That's the process of how we make spirits through the distillation process. Travis, if you're ready, we can go ahead and head upstairs and we can start making some cocktails. Sounds good. And while Garrett's on All his right. way upstairs, uh, sorry everybody, I'm having a little technical difficulties with my, my uh, ear pod there. Um, why don't you just go ahead while he's doing that, you get out your bottle and have a little taste of it by itself. Uh, I don't typically drink room temperature gin, but uh, it's remarkable how smooth this is. I think the 100% corn in the small batch definitely helps, as well as the citrus forward nature of it. But there's hardly any burn on the finish. And uh, I think before we make cocktails with it, we should see what we're tasting. Maybe you've already broken into yours at home. I don't know, but just want to make sure you take this time to do so. Great, great nose. And what's remarkable, too, is that it's 44%. Uh, so there's hardly any burn, um, even with that, at room temperature. Awesome. So uh, when Garrett gets behind the bar there, I'm basically going to show him how to make these cocktails, and then you can follow along at home with the process. Um, and we'll give it about you know, five minutes or so between each drink, so you have time to consume a little bit of it and, and play around with it. It looks like Garrett's upstairs now to uh, show you something else. We are upstairs. Yeah, real quick before we head to the bar, this is our upstairs Rick House, as they call it. So these are the old kind of stored whiskey barrels right here. All right. And before I head to the bar, just real quick, when you talk about charred oak, here's one of our panels right here. That's charred oak. So when whiskey ages, if you can imagine this, in about two years, what it does is breathe. So when it gets cold out, the temperature, the barrel hugs. When the barrel gets warm, it pulls out. That's where you get a little bit of that leakage and a little bit of that wear and tear. So if you notice right here, for all these at Plum Market, this is a limited edition bourbon that has been aged since uh, November 3rd of 2016. This is a new one. So you can see the age difference between the barrels and the aging right there. We did not leave that out in the rain. That's Mother Nature aging uh, whiskey as we speak. So on that note, Travis, you ready to teach me how to make some cocktails? Oh, I'm sure you can do it yourself, but I'd be happy to. All right. I'm going to follow you, my friend. All right. So we're going to start off with the, the gin and tonic, kind of the drink that this was all based around. And a nice, simple thing. Everyone's tasted the gin and tonic, but uh, – Maybe not everyone knows what tonic is. So tonic started as uh, an invention by the, the British primarily as a way to fight malaria in places like Panama. Uh, the quinine that's in the chincona bark, uh, they found fights this uh, malaria. So being Brits, of course, they decided, hey, let's find a way to get this into a cocktail. So basically tea, uh, tonic is tea, and then they carbonate it. Um, the fever tree is one of my favorites to use because it's no artificial sweetener. Um, it does have that quinine uh, flavor in there, uh, and the elderflower one pairs nicely with this because of the floral nature of the drink. So go ahead, grab your glass. Uh, I always like to make sure it's nice and full of ice, and uh, ratios up all up to preference. I think a one-to-one -one ratio is pretty nice. For this glass is probably about two and a half ounces of each. So why don't you go ahead at home and and Garrett and fill up your glass. We're not doing any mixing or not doing any shaking or, or stirring anything. So you want to make sure you got a lot of ice in there for your room temperature gin. A lot of people do garnish a gin and tonic with, with citrus, but this is so citrus forward. I think the, the thyme is a nice natural pairing for it because there's thyme in the gin as well. I think these little clips are pretty fun. You can get them at Joanne Fabric or somewhere online. A nice little touch for your garnish. And of course, the most important part. What do you think, Garrett? Love it. Mind if I give it a try, Travis?
Yeah, the time on there is amazing. Good call. Yeah, especially with it being so like citrus forward, adding like that time to it, amazing. Put X in the corner there. We we'll close that. Yeah. I think I got. Oh, she muted me. So I don't know if it's working or not. I think you're muted. Uh, Garrett, we got you on mute there, buddy. How's there we that? go. There we go. Sorry, everybody at home. No worries. We all know about technology in this age, so. <laughs> but yeah, I think someone keeps trying to steal my signal. Yeah, no worries. What I was tell uh, what I was telling the uh, folks that are listening in is with that citrus that you have, like the concoction of the Plum Market Gin, adding that basil instead of any type of like your typical citrus wedge, uh, absolutely amazing. So adding that tonic to it because the tonic's got that you know the flavor. Yeah, to the it. elderflower, the floral notes kind of already match up. Yeah, and you put that thyme in there. Amazing. That is probably one of the best gin and tonics I've ever had. Excellent. Thank you. Well, you'll have to have mine yeah. sometimes. I actually, I make a tonic of my own. So <laughs> we'll oh, have to do? see if I can Perfect. beat this one. Gotcha. That might be tough. <laughs> yeah. Maybe one day I'll get a bottle in it. We'll see. Right. There you have it, folks, right here from Detroit City Distillery, Travis's own Market Plum Gin, gin and tonic. Amazing. Thank you. Gotcha. Cheers. I'm going to make Lance one. He's been holding the camera the whole time. So. All right. <laughs> All right. After that, we'll get to the next one. Absolutely, guys. My coworker, cameraman, Lance approved, so. Garrett, can you tell us what you just did with the time? How yes, um, that's what, so when you're dealing with any type of herbs when you're making a cocktail, all right, so any type of, like when citrus, when you're dealing with citrus, you wanna muddle it a little bit, you wanna get a little bit more pressure. When you have anything like mint, when you have anything like thyme, what you wanna do, Right here, it's what I call the clap trick. So you take it, and what you're doing is you're giving like a little bit of a hit. What that does is it spritz out the flavor and evaporates when you throw it into your cocktail. So there's some time, so I'm gonna overtime my cocktail right here. You go ahead and take it, just give it one small little smack, like that. Mm -hmm. And that's breaking out the flavors, breaking out the citrus. You put that in your cocktail right there, and then it's what the Scots call a little bit of breathing of the garden. So that comes out. So even before you enjoy your cocktail, once you hold it up to your nose, you can smell that fresh kind of citrus, or sorry, uh, fresh kind of like herbs, be it mint, be it basil, be it thyme, et cetera. So that's what you're doing. Just give it a small little drop it in and um, 
you can enjoy your cocktail three seconds before you give it a sip. Awesome. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, so much of that experience uh, of what we taste is through our nose. So I always love to incorporate that whenever possible. All right, shall we make the next one? All right. Now we get in the technical stuff. Travis is the professional when it comes to the plum market cocktails. I've got all my ingredients. <laughs> Travis, I am going blindly because I, uh, I'm not seeing you on the camera, but walk me okay. through it. I got you. Okay. Well, this, this next one's actually a pretty easy one. It's the last one that has some components to it. So okay. I've, I've got my fancy ice cube. But uh, whatever ice you're using there, got my two-inch cube here. This one is highlighting the Plum Market uh, cold-pressed juice. Um, so one of the amazing things about this, we have this way of gently um, extracting the vitamins and minerals. Uh, you get, so you get whole nutrients that are left intact uh, so you can get optimal absorption. So go ahead and stir this up. So we've got apple, lemon, and ginger. What a, a great pairing for gin in general, but also for this uh, – the botanicals in this one. So we're going to do two and a half ounces and then two ounces of gin. Like I said, it's a nice simple one. And you can get fancy with the garnishes if you like because everything else is already done for you. They, they put all those ingredients right there in the gin. So we're doing two and, two and a half ounces of that juice there, Travis? Yep. And you can even use your little stir if you like. Absolutely. And then two ounces of the gin, right? Uh, yes, sir. I know a lot of people like to use one and a half ounces or you know, that's kind of a standard shot pour, but uh, I'll be refilling that a little too fast if I have to do that. Right. Especially if at home, just relaxing during the quarantine. So we're doing a little stir there. Yeah, I already have the juice cold, but Obviously, we're pouring room temperature gin in there. Gotcha. All right. Do a little bit of garnish, anything you like it, you said? Yeah, I just did a little apple garnish. Uh, you can do a lemon twist or something like that, but kind of playing off of having a bite of the apple and then sipping the drink, they, they just play really well together. I'm going to do a little bit of strawberry on the top over there. really falling in love with some of these juices too oh yeah there's just all kinds of YouTube videos on how to make a fancy apple garnish uh, they're out there for you if anyone wants to look it up but I like what you got going there you know what let's go ahead and put some time in there just for fun see how it tastes Hey, it's your drink. There we are. Go ahead and give it a try. Cheers, Travis. Cheers, all of you at home. So it's definitely not uh, not a weak drink, but I think there's a beautiful balance there. That's amazing, especially this juice you guys are doing. Yeah, that pair is amazing. I think gin is uh, uh, ginger is definitely a hot item in cocktails, yeah. uh, whether it's for the summer or for the winter. Uh, either way, right. but I think this right now is a great summer one. Yeah, that that right there is probably would be my number one summer go-to cocktail. That's great. that's amazing. I'm going to make Lance one of those, too. You definitely want to try one of those. So we do have a question here. I think that it's a great time to go through this question. Um, All right. Someone is asking, what is the best way to garnish right now? So everyone probably has different uh, ways of juicing at home. I actually have my wife's grandma's 
juicer here, which I love using this. People got the hand juicers, you got the fancy ones from the bars, but uh, this works great. This is what I'm gonna use for the lemon for the next cocktail. Awesome, and Garrett, what's your favorite you hear me right, Garrett? garnish right now? My favorite garnish um, of all time, it's, um, it's a loaded question. What's your favorite kind of music? In the summertime, or in the summertime, it's definitely gonna be what uh, Travis is doing right now with gin. Gin is my go-to cocktail um, uh, spirit when it comes to summertime. I love fresh basil. I love fresh strawberry. I love fresh thyme. All right, Just giving it that little like um, additive to it to get that like very, very nice citrusy, get that nice like fresh, like you, you wanna drink a cocktail like you're walking through a garden in the summertime. When I am in the wintertime, my go-to garnish is as, you know, as repeatedly as it's done, I loved smoked cinnamon sticks. Smoked cinnamon sticks, any type of cayenne pepper, any type of like a little bit of like, even like habanero um, honey type of like syrup in it. But mm -hmm. do, you smoke the, do you smoke the yep. sticks for the cocktail? You get a little blowtorch or what do you use? Yeah, I use a blowtorch. So what you want to do, just go ahead, even a lighter too. Go ahead and take a lighter if you don't have a blowtorch. I like to flame it, throw it in, and that kind of creates like a nice cinnamon smoke added to a bourbon. And you can even do it to a gin as well. Um, you add a um, little bit of like cola syrup to a gin um, that's not carbonated and just kind of sit there, sip on some gin. But I just love that smoked garnish of a cinnamon stick just kind of added on to it when you put that like fire to it. So. Cool. Should we get to the next one, you think? Let's do it. I'm here. Cool. I don't, did you hear what I happened to say about the, the citrus? I think my, I cut out again. Yeah, so, uh, so you got the... Uh, juice. You're, you're using, so you're using... Uh, so uh, this is, involves uh, lemon juice, correct? Yep, yep. So we got to juice a lemon or, or half a lemon. We'll do the trick for us here. Uh, yeah, with, a, with a good lime, you can always get a, about an ounce. Um, with a lemon, you can definitely get more than that. Yeah. Oh, a good technique for at home, too. Uh, first of all, don't start with a cold one. Have a warm one. That definitely helps. You can run it under some warm water. And uh, rolling it with your palm can help get that juice to come out a little bit better for you, too. I kind of did that in advance, but I uh, want to make sure you're aware of those little techniques to get some more juice out of your citrus. Yeah, I'm doing that right now. Just kind of roll it on your cutting board, folks. Just like that. And before I go and put this in a shake or anything, I always like to strain it personally. So we're cutting that and we're straining it, Travis? Yep. All right. Just to make sure I have enough, I'll just do the whole thing. But we're looking for uh, a half an ounce. All right. All right, now that we got that out of the way, we're gonna muddle our strawberry. So pick a nice ripe strawberry out of there. Uh, these are actually on sale uh, two for six right now, Plum. They're fantastic, I love these things. I've been eating them every morning for breakfast. So I just cut the top off right there. I'm gonna throw it into my bottom part of my shaker here. And I, I've got a nice muddler wooden one at home, but I'm, I'm sure uh, there's other devices you can use if you don't have one. Or even just a hard shake with ice will get it broken up for you. Travis, I'm embarrassed. Do you have any DC? techniques for people at home that might not have a muddler? Yeah, exactly. So if you do not have a muddler at home, okay, um, what a muddler is, all you have to do I always make the joke, well, one of the funniest things that you can actually do is go ahead and go to your toolbox, get the, um, get the end of a, of a small hammer, all right? Anything that has that, you know, kind of like something that you can go ahead and put in. But if you are in a pinch, sometimes what you can do 
what I like to do is go ahead and take some type of hard surface right there. I'm gonna use some hand sanitizer on this. So I'm using a tonic bottle as a muddler. What I'm doing is I'm putting it in there, slowly muddling all of that in there. And when you're muddling, you don't wanna go ahead and get crazy smashing it down, especially when you're using fruit. Again, especially when you're just using, you wanna infuse all of that and not get crazy because you don't wanna mash it together. All right? That's pretty creative. Yeah. Always use a bottle, always use the end of a hammer. Um, if you do have one of the shakers here too, um, you can always do that as well. Just go ahead, put your hand in there, muddle that up softly, and boom, it's all muddled. Great, that's another great, uh shorthand. Sorry, I'm losing my, my earbud again there. I apologize. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. So we're going to do about five mint leaves or so in this. Okay. And make sure you save your best looking tops for a garnish. Oh, yeah. One, two. All right, so we've got our strawberry. We've got our mint. I'm going to need to measure out half an ounce of lemon juice. And then our simple syrup, half an ounce as well. Simple syrup. Again, here's a real muddler. Sorry, I'm losing the headset there. No worries, no worries. Somebody said. And then throw your ice in there. And for, for mint, I never like to shake it too hard because you're, you're breaking up. We just want to get the, the oils from the mint. We don't want it to get too much of the bitterness. So we're going to do a light shake on this. And if you have a shaker like this at home, Safety is always key. So I always make sure I have one hand on the top and one hand on the bottom. And then just kind of throw it out away from myself. That should do the trick. All right, we've got an ice cube in our glass again. Ice cube in the glass. I have to warn you in advance, this drink is dangerous. It's going to go down, it's not going to taste like there's any gin in there. You'll, you'll get the botanicals, but it's dangerously smooth. All right, Travis, I'm ready. Now, say you didn't have a little strainer at home. Um, is there anything else that you can use? Absolutely, 100%, and I can show that to you right now. What you want to do, so when you, if you're at home and you don't have one of those strainers, what you can do is, I'll be right back. Take any type of glass, it's like a pint, all right? And then any type of smaller plastic cup. So when you're at home, you can cup it like that. So as long as that fits like it, that's 100% perfect. So what you're gonna do, add the ice to the larger glass. I'm just adding water for aesthetics. Go ahead. Take that smaller plastic glass, be it plastic, be it glass. Go ahead and you can give it that shake just like that. Okay? 
just like Travis and I did with our shakers. Mm-hmm. And then as far, as far as the strain goes, um, when you're using a strainer like this, it's just getting a little bit of the um, kind of like excess of the, ci- of the citrus out of it. Sure. Doesn't really matter if you're at home and you're in a pinch and don't want to do it. All you have to do simplistically go ahead and just slowly let that drip out and let the smaller cup catch all of the remnants of it. Got it. Awesome. And then boom, right there. Anyone There's a man home, with experience right there. <laughs> any, anyone at home that uh, has glasses that are larger and smaller than each other can be a maximizolog- master mixologist at home. So. Awesome. <laughs> there you go. So All right, yeah, this is the patio water. crusher right here. Right, there you go. Travis, what are we garnishing this guy with? Uh, nice couple tops of mint uh, and, and expressing the, the aromas like we did with the thyme. So give it a couple slaps, yep. get those oils wakened up. And I always like to pick a couple of the tops and just kind of shove them in there. And like you said, every time you go for a drink, you're getting those aromas. It's really heightening the experience. And then all, all drinks for those at home, be your own artist. Be creative. I'm going to add an apple slice to it just to uh, make Lance uh, happy because this is going to be for Lance. Boom. <laughs> Cheers, Lance. Cheers, Lance. <laughs> So what do you think, Gary? We got we have three cocktails. You can make it home pretty easily. Uh, yeah, nice absolutely. Nice array of flavors. Right. Yeah, we definitely. Um, I'm on, like honestly like tasting this gin from Plum Market, um, and tasting all of our gins. Of course, it's like asking who's your favorite kid. Right now, this is my favorite kid right now because he just graduated from uh, college. So, <laughs> one of the most amazing gins I've ever tasted. Um, Travis did, a, Thank you. Amazing, yeah. Travis did an amazing job with the, choosing the flavor profile. Um, and I'm gonna and you guys did an amazing job executing. <laughs> yeah, I've never tasted more refreshing summer cocktails than I have with the Plum Market Gin, so, yeah. Well, well I really look forward to seeing what you guys come up with, uh, having that yeah. behind your bar there. I'll have Absolutely, to stop yeah. in for sure a couple times to see what you guys come up with. It'd be a, a, a pleasure of mine. <laughs> People have already been calling, so. <laughs> oh great good to hear yeah all right stuff, so. we've had so many comments about how awesome this gin is how great the cocktails are um and we definitely did get some questions so i want to go through those now absolutely yeah any questions you have yeah so the first question um someone asked to describe the garnish holders from joanne's so I'm joanne's. oh so there, it's a little clothes pin I have a whole container of them here. Yeah, all these different colors. Uh, Could you bring the the camera a little closer so everyone can see? But there's just little clothespins. Okay. (laughs) I just thought they were a lot of fun. Yeah. All right. Someone else oh, asked, why, why do you use the big ice cube? Sorry, I lost you again. Garrett, do you um, have any preference yeah, on that? Yeah, absolutely. So when you're using a big ice cube. I'm going to switch um, it over to uh, the speaker. When you're using a big ice cube, the reason people use those big ice cubes is when you throw a lot of shard ice into it, all right, mm-hmm. the ice melts more, okay? And what that does is it proofs down adding more water to your alcohol and your cocktail. So it's kind of taking your spirit and watering it down way too quick. When Travis is, when Travis is using those big ice cubes, what that does is that allows you to go ahead and sip on the spirit or the cocktail and enjoy the actual spirit 
with it out getting watered down too quickly. So if you're using ice cubes, if you're using Lee's, for instance, which I used, Travis has cooler ice cubes that I have, that's going to water down the cocktail a little bit too quickly. When you have that nice solid ice cube block, that allows you to enjoy the cocktail without it getting, quote, ruined or watered down, or as a lot of uh, bartenders call, bruised. So when you have too much watered down liquor, it comes from a uh, bruising of the alcohol with the ice. So that's why those nice chunk ice cubes are ideal when you're A, sipping a bourbon by itself, a gin by itself, or having a cocktail. Got it. Awesome. We had another question also about the first cocktail. Um, so you do equal parts gin and tonic, uh, but mm -hmm. in tall glass, um, this person thought that she's always thought that two to three times gin to tonic ratio or tonic to gin ratio. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, to me, it's personal preference. Um, I mean, whatever you like to do at home. Uh, I, I personally like the one to one, but um, yeah, I, I would say just try it in all, all different manners. You know, martinis, Manhattans, everything, everyone has their own personal preferences. Uh, for like a Manhattan, I like a two to one, a martini, I like a three to one. Um, so I would just do whatever you like to do at home. Absolutely. And, uh, if you're going out to a, a bar and, and, you know, getting this drink, uh, I would just ask the, for a request of that. The bartender should definitely be able to accommodate that. Awesome. And then Garrett, a question for you. Um, how long, how long does it take gin to distill? Um, and then can you distill it in whiskey barrels? Good question. You can distill gin because it is a clear spirit that does not have to be aged. It's all about the ambition of the distiller. You can make a gin in anywhere from six to eight hours or 48 hours. All right. And yes. if you're going to distill gin in a whiskey barrel, that's what they call barrel aged gin or like barren gin, et cetera. Um, that gin is going to take on a color and an aging to it. So for instance, let me look behind here. I think we have one. Yep, we do. So if you look at the Market Plum Gin right here, 100% clear, because that's coming right off of the still with no aging, all right? We do a limited edition barren, barren gin, as we call it. And if you look at that, See the color difference between it? Yeah. What we're doing with this gin is we're taking our classic London dry style gin, letting it sit in a rye barrel for about six to eight months, giving it more of a hue to it. And uh, that's what I like to call the gin that I trick people that don't like gin. So our whiskey drinkers that say, I won't try gin. I give them a little bit of this, this and that. Then finally they get that gin profile and then they start moving on to great gins like Plum Market. Awesome. All right, so we do have a few more questions. Um, one question is for both of you. They want to know um, what your favorite cocktails are. You can start first if you like. My favorite cocktail, and because I am a huge, gigantic history nerd, Travis, you might appreciate this. Hands down, it's simplistic, it's cliche, but hands down the Sazerac cocktail. The, uh, the history behind it, because I'm a big neat drinker, I love uh, whiskey, I like rye, I like bourbons, but the history behind the Sazerac cocktail, which simplistically is just an absinthe rinse, a little bit of sugar, um, or simple syrup added to it, stirred up, rye, tossed up, garnished with a lemon, strained over with no ice, um, is one of my favorite cocktails. It has to do with the history of New Orleans, history of the French coming over. It originally was made by, um, with cognac. Um, and it was called the, uh, originally when the French in New Orleans were adding, you know, just sugar, bitters, absinthe to a cocktail. It was called the cactois or the cocktail. Um, English turned that into the cocktail. Um, so that predated the old fashioned um, because a lot of people um, after the cocktail, the Sazerac cocktail, would go ahead and uh, say, can I just get a cocktail in the old fashioned way? That was the birth of the old fashioned. So I really, from a nostalgic historic point, um, I love Sazerac. Anytime I go in and see a Sazerac cocktail on a menu, uh, that's pretty much my go-to. I always have to 
try that out. So. Awesome. What about you, Travis? Um, well, I'd say it's kind of like similar to my, my preferences in, in wine and beer. Sometimes it's what the, the mood calls for, uh, mm -hmm. what I'm feeling, what the occasion is. Um, so I don't have a ton of go-tos, actually. I like to ex experiment a lot and, and try different things. But I, I'd say if there's one I had to lean on more than anything, it might be the old-fashioned. Um, the way that I like to do it personally is I like to, to make it as a stirred drink. I, I do a demerara syrup and stir it in with everything, and I add a little bit of an Italian Amaro, kind of my personal preference, uh, maybe Montenegro or Averna or something like that, and to give it its own little twist. Um, and then as a stirred drink, sip one to sip the last sip uh, with those large ice cubes, uh, it tastes pretty much the same. Uh, sometimes in an old fashioned, the first sip you get is kind of boozy and you get to the end, you get all the sweet stuff and the fruit. Um, when that's kind of, I think sometimes opposite of the way our palates like to, you know, attack a drink. So um, I think that the stirred version is, is something that's um, kind of a style of it that I like and I like experimenting with different things to, to make it uh, unique. Awesome. Um, this is a really good question. I think it's kind of relevant for everyone who is, is making cocktails at home. Should you add the liquor first or the non-alcoholic components rather, um, or the alcoholic components first? That's a good question. Um, I would say in general, I add the liquor first um, because it, it goes over the ice and starts to chill right away. And as you pour in something like a tonic, it's, it's going to mix it up pretty well. And sometimes you pour in the liquor last, it's sitting on top. Uh, but the majority of the drinks I actually make are, are shaken or stirred, so they're already mixed up. So I don't do a lot of them generally poured that way. But when I do, it's, it's spirit first generally. How about for you, Garrett? I am not trying to suck up to you, Travis, but he's absolutely 100% right in my opinion. Um, I always tell, it's okay I always tell people, yeah, I always tell people too, though, um, as far as like mixing up the cocktail, I always go liquor first, go ahead and add the uh, cordials. I like to add my ice last because if uh, you dump the ice in first and you're kind of like watching, especially if you're watching at home doing like an instructional video like you are today, that ice, especially if you don't have like, like a big, huge cube, all right, that's in there. Um, it's going to water down and bruise that alcohol first. So always put in the liquor, put in the cordials, et cetera. Then right before you stir, right before you uh, kind of mix, like Travis was talking with, with these cocktails, remember he said, all right, and then add the ice. Boom. That's going to give your cocktail a little bit more flavor, less of that watered down, less of that bruised taste. Awesome. One more question, I think. Um, so, as a gin drink, um, someone remembers the Gimlet as being the summer drink. Um, do you still see that in style? Do you drink it on ice? What's your preferred way to serve it? One, Travis, I don't know, you wanna go? Sorry. Oh, go ahead, go for it. 100%, totally in style, totally awesome. Um, I prefer, gin gimlets not over ice basically in a coupe glass like this that's how they used to do it in the old style um you can garnish it with a lime but literally just basically it is a martini um gin martini with a little bit of simple syrup and that lime juice and drink it uh in my opinion not over ice but again two one zone you know i'm uh there's no such thing as a bad drink in my opinion which is a comedian W.C. Fields used to say. There's nothing, 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 uh, there's no such thing as a wrong drink. But yeah, Gimlet's definitely in style. Any bar, any bartender should be able to make it for you. Enjoy it. Perfect summer drink, especially outside. So, and this gin is already citrus based, uh, it's kind of citrus forward. So that seems a natural pairing. Yeah, I personally have never been able to just sip gin. And this gin, I can just drink it straight because it's... Yeah, well, isn't that remarkable? <laughs> yeah, it really is. It shocked me because that citrusy taste is so strong and it's so, so nice and refreshing. Well, do we have any other questions? Well, um, someone is asking aquafaba or egg white. I'm not entirely sure. What was the first part? I heard egg white. Aquafaba or egg white. I'm not sure what that first thing is, actually. Aquafaba? <laughs> I'm assuming that's an artificial egg white? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, well, the, the purpose of egg whites is to add texture to the drink. So um, I have seen some substitute ones before. Maybe someone is, is vegan or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. They do work not quite as well, um, but um, there's a couple different rules of thumb on, uh, on shaking for egg white drinks too. Um, some people will do a dry shake first and then add the ice and shake it. Um, or some people I've even seen shake it with the ice, then strain it and then dry shake it afterwards. Um, really, you're just looking to, to get that fluffy texture. That's the key. You're not really getting a lot of flavor with the egg whites. Uh, if you mix it with the yolk, then you're getting a little bit more. Uh, and there's a lot of fun drinks to do that way too. But uh, egg whites, uh, great thing for texture and drinks. Absolutely. I just don't know familiar with all the alternatives. I've used a couple, but um, the ones that I've used before just didn't have as, as much of the uh, ability to, to get it fluffy, but they still did work. Okay. Here, do you have any insight on that? I was actually going to, I will claim ignorance. I too have not heard of the first one, but when it comes down to just regular egg whites, what they were, uh, used to do, especially when they invented the Ramos Gin Fizz um, at the World's Fair, I think it was in 1932. That's when they used original egg whites. I like to stick with the original. Um, I have not heard of the first one. It's artificial. Um, but yeah, I would, I would go original egg whites. But you know, depending on your dietary um, restrictions, yeah, I would, go the, I would go the first one if that is artificial egg whites. Um, again, always, every time you're drinking a cocktail, whatever floats your boat, there's nothing... Uh, there's no such thing as a wrong drink, but I would go egg whites on the first, on the, on that answer. Just in the right. fact that the fluffiness, how it, like Travis was explaining, it mm -hmm. does do a, it does do a cocktail uh, justice, especially with gin. So. Awesome. Yeah. I think someone else actually mentioned, um, Lorraine actually let us know that it is the juice from canned chickpeas. That's what aquafaba is. So I'm assuming that is used as kind of a substitution. Oh. The juice from the juice from chickpeas can yes. can chickpeas. Interesting. Okay, yeah. Well, I'll be exploring sure. that soon. <laughs> I know. I Travis, we'll have that up. Se Travis, we'll have a separate conference call and look it up. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Some drink. <laughs> all right. Well, that was kind of that was all the questions that we have. Um, I want to give a huge thank you to Travis and Garrett for being here with us tonight sharing their experience and wisdom with all of us. Not only did we get to learn about the history of gin, its current relevancy in the, the market, and then also about Detroit City Distillery. Um, but we also got to add three new cocktails for our bartending repertoire, so it's kind of a win-win. Um, if you enjoyed tonight's tasting, we would love to have you join us again. We offer a virtual tasting experience every single week, and I will actually show you how you can find any upcoming tastings and purchase the items that are paired with it. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and kind of walk you through how to do that. All right. So if you go to plummarket.com um, and then you choose virtual events over here, it's gonna bring you to this page where you can select your state. So for all of us, it's going to be Michigan. And then this is kind of a listing of all of the current events or the events that we have coming up. From this page, you can actually register online. That's gonna take you to the Zoom registration page where you put in your name and email. And then you can also order the wines um, or liquor, whatever whatever goes with that, that week's tasting. Um, and I'm gonna show you, you know, you can click on that button and then I'm gonna show you where to go next. So that is going to take you to this page. Um, and then in this menu up here, you can see the virtual events tab. You're going to scroll over that um, and then that's gonna show you the list of our upcoming tastings. You can click into that. This is from today's tasting. This is kind of what you, you all went through to get your kits. And you can just add those to your basket. Checkout is super easy. Once you check out, it can save your information. So it's really easy for next time. And um, that's it's really that simple. <laughs> so now that you know how to join us again, um, we hope that you do, of course. And I hope everyone enjoyed tonight's tasting. Thank you again to Travis and Garrett for being here with us. It was so great to have both of you on here. 
And I hope that all of you have a wonderful weekend. Maybe break out the market gin again. Have another cocktail tomorrow. And until next time, cheers from Plum Market. Thank you. Bye, folks. Thank you. Thank you, Travis. Thank you, Garrett. Absolutely. Bye, guys. Bye.